Welcome to this video on the top 10 vampires of Clan Ravnos from the role-playing game Vampire the Masquerade. If you've played either of the video games associated with the Vampire the Masquerade setting, you're probably wondering, what the hell is a Ravnos? Well, the Ravnos weren't featured in either game. Hell, they put a Nagaraja in the Vampire video game before they put a Ravnos in one. The Ravnos started out as the gypsy vampires of the setting, then underwent a massive lore shift and became the Indian vampires with gypsy cousins, who fight the Kuei Jin. This had potential, but then White Wolf decided to wipe out most of the clan in that whole Week of Nightmares business. But here are some of the leading lights of the clan who served as the appetizer to Gehenna. Without further ado, the top 10 vampires of Clan Ravnos. Number 10, Durga Sin. Now let's pretend you're listening to these in alphabetical order. Since I ended the top 10 vampires of Clan Nosferatu with Baba Yaga, I'll start the top 10 vampires of Clan Ravnos with Durga Sin, one of Baba Yaga's greatest enemies. Like Baba Yaga centuries before, Zenobia was a priest of one of the pre-Christian pagan religions of Russia that worshiped a goddess of the earth. Zenobia, in addition to being a priestess, was a trusted mediator between hostile villages and tribes in ancient times. Eventually, her skill at bringing peace was called upon by the supernatural forces native to Russia, including vampires, werewolves, changelings, mages, and spirits. It was Zenobia who negotiated peace between the Ravnos and the werewolves of Novgorod Forest, an act that was said to have lasting consequences for centuries going forward. On the other side was Baba Yaga, now centuries old herself, embittered and maddened by what was forever lost to her and by what she had done. Her spirit was twisted and deformed, and she delighted in bringing misery and chaos wherever she could, fomenting wars between people, calling down curses and sickness for any slight, perceived or real. It was Baba Yaga who pushed the werewolves and the Ravnos to war in the Novgorod forest, and she was livid that Zenobia had spoiled her bloody game. The Nosferatu vowed to put an end to Zenobia's interference in her fun, one way or another. Baba Yaga came to Zenobia one night and offered to embrace her, to make her second in Russia only to the Iron Hag herself, to become her immortal daughter in exchange for an eternity of obedience. It's ironic that Baba Yaga would demand eternal submission from another Russian priestess, considering that's what the Nosferatu antediluvian had planned for Baba Yaga and that Baba Yaga unleashed an actual, capital D, demon in Russia to escape from him, at least for a while. Zenobia expressed gratitude for Baba Yaga's <coughs> generous offer, but that she was content to experience the full cycle of life and death by her own will and by that of the goddess. Baba Yaga was now well and truly pissed off. She cursed the beautiful priestess with an illusion to appear aged and withered before her time. As she departed, Baba Yaga also vowed to wash away the pagan religions of Russia with a tide of blood and steel from the west. Baba Yaga's vengeance soon came to pass as warriors and missionaries from the Church of the West came to bring the pagans of Rus under the authority of the cross. Zenobia's pleas for negotiation fell on deaf ears as the missionaries and warriors tore down the holy places of the pagans and put their own churches and temples in their place. Zenobia was wounded in one such battle. Like a carrion crow, Baba Yaga watched the battle unfold. She would have Zenobia as her child, whether she wished it or not. But there were other eyes on the battle as well. The Ravnos, owing a boon to the priestess for restraining the fury of the werewolves, created an illusory army to distract the Iron Hag while they carried off the real Zenobia. The priestess asked the Ravnos to allow her to pass into death. Their leader, Vladivos, regarded Zenobia as too valuable an asset against Baba Yaga to be permitted to die, and embraced her around 923 AD. Now this is where I have to simultaneously try and cobble together some contradictory lore. The oldest mention of Durga Sin's embrace claims that she was embraced in the third century. However, stories about the adventures of the Apostle St. Andrew notwithstanding, the Bible was not translated into Old Slavic until the ninth century by Cyril and Methodius, honored in the Orthodox Church as the Apostles to the Slavs. The other piece of information is that magic began to disappear from the world around the time of Durga Sin's embrace. House Tremere, 
still mortal and members of the Order of Hermes, were allegedly the first to notice the waning of magic around 996 AD, which led to their mad scramble to retain their immortality, resulting in their becoming vampires. So, in light of those two facts, Durgasin being embraced around 923 AD as mentioned in Rage Across Russia makes more sense than in the 3rd century AD as claimed in Children of the Inquisition. Cenobia, now a creature of death and darkness, took the name Durgasin, which is an amalgamation of the name of the Hindu goddess Durga, the goddess of war, and the Norse goddess Sin, or refusal. So her name could be understood as a goddess who refuses or rejects war. Baba Yaga, who had somehow managed to still tie her corrupted magics to the land, fell into torpor soon after Durgasin's embrace. Her followers either continued to do her bidding in the shadows or fled west, where they hoped their little grandmother's summons could not reach them. Durgasin sabotaged the plans of Baba Yaga's loyalists and even managed to undo part of the hag's curse on her. In 1493, Durgasin attended the Convention of Thorns in the aftermath of the First Anarch Revolt. On the fifth night of deliberations that would end in the birth of the Camarilla, she took the podium to urge the attendees to consider a third path, between the calls of utter domination of mortals being preferred by Hardestad of Clan Ventru, and the masquerade being urged by Rafael de Corazon of Clan Toreador. Durgasin chided both, the one for the presumption that the same elders who could not even rule over their rebellious Anarch Childer could somehow rule a tide of thousands and eventually millions of mortals, and the other for indulging in the fantasy that the masquerade could last forever. She urged that vampires should leave mortals alone, neither hiding from mortals nor seeking to lord over them. Naturally, the founders and the Anarchs listened and then promptly ignored her. Someone would listen to Durgasin, though. The Prince of Wallachia, Glad Dracula. Thanks to the Ravnos, Dracula entered into the Society of Vampires on his own terms and managed to avoid falling into the schemes of both the Camarilla and the Sabbat. In 1991, when Baba Yaga rose from torpor, Durgasin marshaled the Russian Ravnos along with any vampire who would not serve the Iron Hag and had the courage to fight against her. When Baba Yaga disappeared in 1998, Durgasin was the single most powerful vampire remaining in Russia, but one year later, in 1999, the Week of Nightmares struck Clan Ravnos. Durgasin and the Russian Ravnos were spared the worst effects, thanks to the lingering effect of the Shadow Curtain, though her child, Zlato, had to stake her to prevent her from harming herself or anyone else. Number 9. Etienne de Faberge the future Prince of Dirt was born in the Savoyard town of Faberge in the latter 1070s AD. From childhood, he was afflicted with a certain amount of spiritual guilt. He saw sin all around him, in the milliner who ripped off farmers who brought him their grain, in the nobles who seduced peasant girls and left their bellies full with bastard children, in the drunken priest who couldn't be bothered to rouse himself in the morning for the mass, even his own conception was an act of lust, and therefore he was a product of original sin. Etienne spent hours each day in church praying and begging for God's mercy. In fact, prayer was his sole joy in life, and he continued, even when his father beat him for what the father decided was laziness and shirking his duties. The only punishment that his father could mete out to Etienne that terrified him was denying him permission to join a monastery and dedicate his entire life to prayer. When one of Pope Urban II's preachers arrived in Faubert to extol the virtues of the First Crusade, Etienne believed that God had called him to the Holy Land, and that he might at last feel forgiveness for his own sins. Though his father objected, Etienne joined his local lord's retinue as a man-at-arms, and sailed with the French army to the Holy Land in 1095 AD. But the barbarity of the Crusaders shocked Etienne to his core. When the Crusaders took Antioch in 1099, he watched in horror at the scene of his fellows as they looted the city and brutalized the inhabitants. When some Italian soldiers from Pisan robbed a Jewish merchant's house, he rebuked them for their impiety and implored them to return to God's service. Instead, they beat Etienne down and held him there while they slit the throats of the merchant and his entire family, one by one, before Etienne's eyes. After the Italians left, Etienne began to weep with the corpses of the murdered but an Armenian came and offered to help him bury the dead. The two buried the family with as much dignity as they could and prayed over them. 
When they were done, the Armenian introduced himself as Barsic and talked of God and the inevitable coming of the apocalypse. Etienne, having witnessed a small preview of the apocalypse that very night, wanted to know more, but Varsik told him that they would speak more on another night. As the rape and pillage subsided and order was restored, Varsik found Etienne again the following night and introduced him to the beliefs of the Ravnos Basharites, an offshoot that combined Christian theology and the western path of paradox. Varsik told Etienne about the truth of the world, of God's plan, and Etienne's possible place in that plan. Then Varsik revealed himself as a Ravnos and offered Etienne the chance to usher in the apocalypse and do God's will. Etienne accepted the embrace without hesitation that very night. In 1120 AD, Varsik brought Etienne to Accra, a city that no vampire had been able to enter for a thousand years. Varsik's true plan for Etienne was for his piety to allow him entrance to Accra, where he would retrieve the fragment of the true cross left there by St. Paul. Etienne got closer than any vampire in memory had, but as he reached across the threshold of the gates of Accra, his arms burst into flames. Despite being part of God's plan, Etienne's blood betrayed him, and God still found him wanting. Varsic was disappointed, but still had a use for his child. He encouraged Etienne to claim Accra as his domain, despite being unable to enter the city itself, as only a vampire as pious as Etienne was truly deserving of the role. Secretly, Varsic wanted Etienne to serve as a guard dog on the city and frustrate the schemes of any other vampires to claim the true cross. None opposed his so-called princedom, though other vampires snidely referred to Etienne as the Prince of Dirt, a prince who held court in a caravansary well outside of the city that he was supposedly the prince of. In 1217 AD, after the true cross was stolen from Acre by the crusader Hothier de Dampierre and the knights who would later go on to found the poor knights of the Passion of the Cross of Acre, Varsic sent his other child, Aram Hovanes, to depose Etienne. Etienne declared himself a vassal of Lord Jürgen the Swordbearer, who himself was a vassal to the Ventru Lord Hardestat. In 1291, when the Muslim armies reclaimed Accra, the Ashira allowed Etienne to retain not only his unlife, but his title of prince as well, so long as he converted to Islam. His information network survived for centuries and so did he, despite the region changing hands thanks to wars and politics. The Ravnos Prince of Accra, or Akko, remained as the city passed into Israeli hands and in the modern nights, masquerades as a humble beggar on the outskirts of the city. Number eight, Alexis Sorokin. Alexis Sorokin was born in the early 18th century in Russia during the reign of Peter Alexievich, or Peter the Great, who transformed the Tsardom of Russia into the Russian Empire through military expansion and modernization. But wars and reforms tend to cost money, however, and Peter required a great deal of it. Hence, Peter collected a head tax on the already downtrodden serfs of Russia. Alexis's father was one of Peter's most effective tax collectors, earning him the Tsar's favor, and Alexis benefited from her father's loyalty. She was selected, along with a handful of other favored youths from the nobility and the bureaucracy, to travel through Western Europe to study their science and culture and bring them back to benefit Mother Russia. Alexis traveled to Vienna, Austria, a city that the Habsburgs were transforming into the cultural capital of Europe in the 18th century. Baroque architecture was going up all over the city. Musicians, playwrights, painters, and poets gathered in the city of music in search of inspiration and patronage. Alexis studied the sciences, the crafts, and the arts, but art is what truly captured her spirit and would lead to her eventual placement on the red list. Despite being enwrapped with art, Alexis had neither the talent nor the discipline to make a serious go as an artist of any kind. But she had grace and charm, and soon found herself mixed with the circles of the city's idle, young, and wealthy, who saw Alexis as an exotic and captivating oddity. To the highbrow Austrians, the Russians were one step removed from being barbarians themselves. Yet she, with her exotic beauty and easy charm, had the aristocrats soon eating out of her hand. Alexis's criminal career started simply enough. She palmed a bracelet from a rival for the attention of a young man. But the thrill was great and that she needed to do it again and again, and each theft was more daring than the one that came before it. 
Soon, Alexis, still unsuspected of these robberies, has scandalized the Viennese nobility about the master thief moving through their palaces and salons. Some of those she had stolen from were either the pawns or under the protection of the Austrian Ventru, who were enraged at this offense against their dignity. One week before Alexis was to return to Moscow, she met a dark, brooding, and handsome man at a soiree who, unbeknownst to her at the time, was Dmitri of Clan Ravnos, who had been warned by the prince and his Tremere lieutenant to be on his best behavior while in Vienna. Alexis saw Dmitri and fell in love immediately and set about seducing him. Dmitri, accustomed to this game, thought only to feed on her at first, but when she whispered to him about her secret burglaries of the Austrian nobles, he was intrigued and restrained himself, curious to see just how far her larcenous streak ran. The next night, she took him to her apartments and displayed the trophies of her criminal career. Bracelets, jeweled combs, brooches, all modest in size but of the highest quality and value. Dimitri knew then that she had the eye of a master thief and would make an ideal addition to the clan. More importantly, he had fallen in love with Alexis and divulged his true nature to her as a vampire and a thief. He barely finished when she begged him to embrace her. So he did, ending her mortal life and creating a new child of Clan Ravnos. Alexis and Dimitri left Vienna for Paris soon after her embrace. There, Alexis learned the tricks of makeup, wigs, and mannerisms to disguise herself without the use of disciplines, though she would soon learn those as well. She also learned that Dimitri was not a thief of art or trinkets. He stole other vampires. Dimitri was a fence for the blood market, a network that traded in kidnapped and staked vampires, as well as disciplines forcibly extracted from those same vampires. Alexis benefited from the blood market to learn such disciplines as obfuscate, protean, quietus, and vicissitude. In time, her infatuation with Dimitri waned. His trade did not offend her, but kidnapping and slavery lacked the glamour and artistry of a well-organized and executed heist of a priceless artifact. Alexis spent more time away from Dimitri and more among the Toreador of Paris, or rather, Danya, her new identity, insinuated herself into the Toreador salons as a poser. Their sophistication and pageantry made her resentful that she had not been embraced as one of them, rather than as a Ravnos. Dimitri noticed her prolonged absences and moved quickly to blood bond her to him. Their relationship changed from lovers, or even as sire and child, to domitor and servant, with Dimitri commanding Alexis to commit robberies throughout Europe on his behalf for over a century. The Toreador, after much time and expense, learned that it was Danya who had robbed them, though her disguise was so good that they did not unmask the Ravnos underneath it, Alexis Sorokin. Up to that point, the Toreador considered Danya a simpleton and a harmless poser. The Parisian Toreador were outraged to have been tricked, but could find no help from the other clans, as they considered the theft of a few baubles less concerning than the disappearances of elders into Dimitri's blood market. Rather than hiring a few Asimites to settle the matter quickly and quietly, they plotted an elaborate revenge plan as unnecessarily layered as it was intricate. They would lure Danya and Dimitri back to Paris with an original manuscript by Mozart, commissioned by a Toreador centuries before and unheard by mortal ears. The Toreador were reluctant to put such a priceless piece at risk, but to catch a fox, you need bait that smells powerfully enough to overwhelm their natural wariness. And this bait was too good to pass up for Dimitri, who made plans for he and Alexis to return to Paris and steal it. But Alexis immediately recognized the trap and tried to warn Dimitri. But Dimitri, convinced of his own luck, had grown overconfident. The Parisian Toreador planned a great ball, a venue where all of the kindred of Paris could witness them catch the master thieves in the act. Meanwhile, Alexis cased the location of the ball and made plans not only to steal the Mozart manuscripts, but to rid herself of Dimitri all in one night. Alexis, playing to Dimitri's arrogance, convinced him to act as the distraction while she slipped away to steal the Mozart manuscripts before anyone noticed she was gone. During one of the dances, Dimitri, supposedly drunk from the wine and champagne-laced blood flowing through the party, accidentally fell into the lap of a Toreador elder, sending both sprawling to the floor. The Toreador ghouls simultaneously pushed their way through the confusion to investigate and covered the exits. 
Alexis, using a combination of obfuscate and chimistry to shed her Danya disguise and appear as her normal self, stepped into the dancing without drawing attention to herself. Dimitri, realizing that he was trapped, frenzied. The ghouls staked him. Alexis took the opportunity to bump a candelabra into the expensive drapery. The subsequent fire spread quickly. The Toreador, who weren't pushing past the ghouls to escape the smoke and flames, ran around struggling to save the priceless artwork. The ghouls frantically tried to restore order, albeit with weapons in their hands. Alex obfuscated herself and raced out of the ballroom into the upper floors for the Mozart manuscripts. As she liberated the works from their glass casing, the lower floor had almost been completely engulfed. This had been part of her plan as well. She transformed into mist using Protean and rode the rising smoke away from the mansion to the opposite side of Paris. Alexis's addition to the Red List, which is filled with psychopaths, monsters, diablerists, infernalists, and worse, is a reminder of just how petty and vindictive vampire elders can be. For her part, Alexis thrives on her reputation as the world's greatest thief, almost as much as she loves tweaking the noses of the Toreador at every given opportunity. Number 7. Tatiana Stepanova From one Russian Ravnos to another, Tatiana Stepanova was born from the illicit dalliance between a Russian noblewoman and an itinerant raconteur, or storyteller. Though her lawful father never discovered Tatiana's true parentage, he never liked the girl. Eventually, Tatiana grew old enough for the feeling to become mutual, and she rebelled against both of her parents' authority. From equal parts exasperation and utility, the Stepanovas agreed to marry Tatiana off to another family for political reasons, in the form of a man significantly older than Tatiana. After meeting her soon-to-be husband, Tatiana fled from her parents' house. In the following year, she disguised herself as a man and took up robbery in order to survive. During one such housebreaking, she witnessed what she thought was one man biting another on the throat and apparently drinking his blood. Tatiana scrambled to hide from the obvious madman and took the first chance she got to get the hell out of there. But the next night, she saw the blood drinker again, or she thought she saw him, just out of the corner of her eye. In the following week, she caught glimpses and hints of the man, always just enough to arouse her suspicions, but never anything certain. And her robbery suddenly became more perilous, as if someone were placing obstacles in her path, alerting her targets to her attempts. Her halls got smaller and smaller, and times got leaner. After six months of this, the blood-drinking man finally presented himself fully to Tatiana on a cold winter night. The first thing she noticed about Vasily Vasilievich, as he introduced himself, was that he wasn't breathing. No steam, so common in the Russian winters, rose from either his nose or his mouth. Tatiana's mind was filled with the old tales of nocturnal bloodsuckers, vampires, she turned to flee, but Vasily was already behind her. She fled in the opposite direction, and he gave no move to chase. The next night, he repeated the scene. For two weeks, Vasily would appear to her on the streets and send her running for her life. Eventually, Tatiana didn't leave her small apartment and huddled in a corner, waiting for Vasily to get bored with his game and finally kill her. Tatiana got her wish. As Vasily's fangs pierced her neck, she knew that she was about to die. What she didn't know was that Vasily intended to make her his child and use her talent for burglary to his own ends. Vasily did not care to instruct Tatiana much on the nature or customs of vampires. Tatiana despised Vasily for embracing her, and she hated her newfound need for blood to survive. Tatiana would spend three decades trying to free herself from Vasily while gathering enough information on vampire society in order to integrate herself. After escaping Vasily, she made herself useful to those she recognized as the most powerful vampires, who both terrified and fascinated her. Tatiana left Russia and traveled throughout Europe, gathering enough information to conceal her true identity as a Ravnos. Using the knowledge she acquired in Russia and France, she successfully masqueraded as a Bruja during the French Revolution. In the aftermath, she picked up stakes again and moved to the United States. In America, she developed new identities as Gangrel and Malkavian, in addition to her old identity as a Bruja. During the course of her travels in America, she rendered service to the Justicar of Clan Ventru and the very first Alistair, Lucinda. Quick side note, an Alistair is a special kind of Archon, whose sole duty is to track, and exterminate, vampires on the Red List. 
sort of like a special task force with a generous dose of qualified immunity from the authority of princes. Anyway, Tatiana had infiltrated a group of anarchs in Seattle, Washington in the mid-90s, led by the Bruja Lilith Storm, where she caught rumblings about a plot against the Nosferatu Justicar Petrodon, who made his haven in the city. She gave what information she had to Lucinda, who, after being confirmed as the Ventru Justicar, invited Tatiana to serve as one of her archons. Tatiana's inaugural mission was the capture of Janina, a Samedi who freely indulged in diablerie and violated the masquerade repeatedly. Tatiana was part of the coterie that tracked Janina to San Francisco, staked her, and sent her body to the inner circle for judgment. During the Week of Nightmares, Tatiana's rejection of her Ravnos heritage proved to be her salvation. She resisted the frenzy provoked by the rise of Zapata Shura, primarily because there were no other Ravnos nearby to intensify the madness provoked by the antediluvian summons. She has no idea what actually happened, but suspects that it was some supernatural attack directed against her personally by some yet unknown enemy. Number 6. Dr. Lawrence Mayhew. It seems like I'm introducing at least one scholar, scientist, doctor, or other bookworm in all of these videos on the clans. Dr. Lawrence Mayhew's early life is unknown, save that he graduated from Oxford University with a degree in archaeology near the end of the 19th century. Mayhew went on a family trip to India to explore and, if possible, plunder a few ruins and lost cities on the subcontinent. Mayhew's thoroughness and eye for detail attracted the attention of a Brahmin Ravnos named Jayakumar. Jayakumar approached Mayhew as a fellow scholar, engaging the Englishman to discuss his research and findings, something that almost no scholar will ever pass up an opportunity on, to fill up an unsuspecting ear with a flood of observations, theories, and jargon. And Mayhew was delighted to tell the knowledgeable Indian gentleman all about his findings. In the fashion of the Indian Ravnos, the decision to embrace Lawrence Mayhew was made without his input or even his knowledge. An accident was arranged to give the appearance of his death. Ghouls brought him before Jayakumar where he was subjected to the ritualistic embrace preferred by the Brahmin Jati. Mayhew resented his newfound state, if only for the loss of his daylight hours, but considered the freedom from mortal frailties a fair trade, at least at first. Soon, the true reason for his embrace was made clear. Jayakumar wanted to know everything there was to know about the West, in anticipation for what might have been the finishing stroke from the Azura Tazaya and the possibility that the Ravnos of India could be forced to flee their homeland. But once Jayakumar learned all that he needed to know, he dismissed Mayhew, who did not object. In truth, Mayhew had no further taste for these supernatural feuds going back into the mists of antiquity, still being played out in more enlightened times. He traveled to America, a place he assumed to be sufficiently far enough out of the orbit of the Ravnos, and insinuated himself into Harvard University as a specialist in Indian archaeology, where he stayed for several decades. While at Harvard, he embraced two of his most promising pupils, Johann Matheson and Zachary Carter. Johann brought two progeny of his own into Mayhew's circle, a fellow Oxford alumnus named Gwendolyn Brand and Marion French, an army veteran who acted as the muscle, so to speak, of the circle of archaeologists that came to be known as the Grave Robbers. Rounding out Dr. Mayhew's merry little band of grave robbers was Angelica Underwood, another Oxford grad and a sister in blood to Dr. Mayhew, by way of their mutual sire, Jayakumar. After spending an unhappy decade as a servant of Jayakumar, Underwood was sent by her sire to fetch Mayhew back to India before the week of nightmares happened. Instead, she went back to London to look in on the parents who thought she was dead, and then she went to Boston to see Mayhew. Mayhew convinced her to join his archaeology group. After the week of nightmares, Mayhew and the grave robbers established a haven inside of a Calcutta manor, which they used as a base of operations to plunder the havens of dead Ravnos elders and try to gather up all of the lore and artifacts they could carry back to Boston with them. But with India now seemingly wiped clean of Ravnos, the Azura Tazaya, the Khoijin, have no intention of allowing any vampires to remain in India. Mayhew and the grave robbers engage in a deadly game of cat and mouse with the Khoijin in India, all while Mayhew and Underwood secretly harbor the fear that Jayakumar may have somehow survived the week of nightmares and tricked them into returning to India, and possibly his service.
Number 5. Calorus. Calorus is one of the most notorious Gorgio, or non-gypsy vampires, in the Western Ravnos clan. He is one of the greatest liars, con men, and tricksters in the clan, and one of the few Gorgio who could pass among the Roma Ravnos without being attacked on sight. In life, Calorus was born in Spain and took to the life of a roving charlatan. He had no family, no home, no aspirations save for swindling the next mark living off of the take, and then looking for the next mark. One such con brought him, quite accidentally, into the world of vampires, as Calorus, disguised, found himself in the coach of a nobleman who spoke a little too freely about matters of blood and unlife. Calorus thought that the man was either mad or actually a vampire. Either way, his life depended on playing to this fool, and spun the nobleman such a story, or rather, a web of lies and innuendo so grand, that Calorus managed to escape the coach to tell the tale. Unfortunately, Calorus' escape emboldened him, and he wondered how far he could carry a con against others of the noble's kind. After months of preparation, developing contacts, and forging essential papers, Calorus launched the most ambitious scheme of his life, masquerading as a vampire among vampires. The scam lasted well over a year before it failed, but the one who saw through it was none other than Magdra, an old and respected Roma Ravnos, who was so amused by Calorus that he was compelled to make the Spaniards lie into a reality and embraced him in 1632 AD. At this time, the Roma held sway among the Ravnos of Western Europe, and their general rule was that the embrace was only to be given to members of the family. So Magdra sent Calorus away to England, as soon as Calorus landed in merry old England, he launched a three and a half centuries long deception including dozens of identities, several international crime rings, and no few upstanding but thoroughly ignorant citizens. Calorus, the Jackdaw King, is an enigma, and no one can be sure where he'll turn up next, or what he'll con his next mark out of. Number 4. Cairo. Following the downfall of Sangris, the Archbishop of Montreal, the Sabat Inquisition kept a close eye on the city for signs of infernalism. In 1993, they dispatched two night inquisitors to track down any accomplices Sangris might have left among the city Sabat, a Nosferatu anti-tribu named Krieg and a Ravnos anti-tribu named Elisa Carini. The two took different paths to infiltrate the city. Krieg appeared as a nomad, while Carini entered the city as Sonia, mistress of illusions, and joined the traveling masquerade-breaking freak show run by a Zemitsi named Zarnovich. While in Montreal, Carini, a follower of the Path of Cathari, took the opportunity to further her study of the path with a pack known as the Widows, the most devout Catharists in the Sabbat. Carini, however, carelessly let her duties as an inquisitor take a backseat to her affiliation with the Widows in their brothel haven, the Heart. Even worse, and this is going to be the third video he makes an appearance in, your friend and mine, the demon-worshipping Bruja piece of trash, Pierre Belmer, figured out exactly who Carini was after capturing Krieg and treating him to nearly two weeks of non-stop torture. But Belmer had a different fate in mind for Carini. He lured Carini to an abandoned house in old Montreal. In the house was the demon Metathiax's blood circle. She walked right into the trap. Diseased rats swarmed Carini as Belmare called on his patron to rot Carini's body and will until she broke. The demon then reformed her into a shape more pleasing to Belmare. Gone was the sinewy, black-haired, Ravnos Knight Inquisitor, Elisa Carini. In her place was a stocky, red-haired, pierced riot girl, Cairo, whose soul was chained to Belmare's every whim. But what neither Belmare nor his master realized is that Carini, now Cairo, was a fairly skilled thaumaturgist and immediately began working to break Belmare's grip on her soul. Five years later, she managed to free herself for a few nights per week and escape from Belmare's pack, Les Orphelines. When the Toreador anti-tribu Night Inquisitor, Mercy, began her rampage in Montreal, Cairo slipped away from Belmare and found the La Sombra Archbishop of Montreal, Carolina Velez. Cairo begged Velez for protection from Belmare and in exchange, she would lead Velez straight to him. Velez, not being a complete moron, informed Mercy, and in a coordinated strike between Mercy's talons,
Velez's Lost Angels, and the Shepherds of Cain. They wiped out Pierre Belmere's infernalist Le Orphelin's pack, though Belmere himself escaped. Mercy had been denied her ultimate prize, which was good for no one. She charged both Archbishop Velez and Cairo with infernalism. Velez was too busy trying to save her own skin to honor any promises she might have made to Cairo. Cairo pleaded her innocence, but her words fell on deaf ears. Final death might have been a, well, mercy compared to what her sentence was. Cairo was staked and sent to Mexico City to spend the rest of her existence as a torture doll for Sabbat Inquisitors to perfect their techniques upon. Number three, Givran Dalal. As a mortal, Givran Dalal was a pure hedonist. He wandered India in search of new pleasures and pains, facilitated by his sociopathic charm and beauty to manipulate the minds of others. Givran's cultists were willing to give him everything they had, even their lies. His pursuit of pleasure led to an exploration of torture and death. He especially fixated on the moment at which the soul left the body. His devotees, more akin to slaves in his hand, could only hope for a quick death because he would never grant them a painless one. A Ravnos named Marcus Cozier discovered Givron in the husk of a temple near Delhi, where Givron conducted a ceremony before his enthralled followers. On his altar was a young boy, stripped naked before his followers, including the child's own willing parents. Givron skinned the boy alive, tossing his bloody flesh into the crowd for their nourishment. Marcus was captivated by Givron's ability to strip mortals of their very humanity with nothing but his own personality and manipulation. He decided that Givron would be the perfect companion to stave off the ennui of immortality. When Marcus offered him the embrace, Givron, having experienced nearly every possible pleasure a human could know, wanted to see what lay on the opposite side of death. For a time, Marcus and Givron traveled through southern Asia, as in life, Givran attracted followers, desperate for his attentions, willing to give him anything, even their blood. But in time, Givran grew bored with Marcus, who Givran regarded as a bore without imagination, little more than a voyeur to Givran's pursuit of pleasure and pain. Givran commanded his followers to bind his sire tight. When Marcus could not resist, Givran then told the followers to tear off Marcus's flesh and eat it. They hastened to obey. Marcus screamed for the mercy of death, and Givron, in his last act of obedience to his sire, obliged him by biting into his skull and drinking his blood and soul. The madness of the diablerie caused Givron to frenzy and slaughter his followers down to the last. Givron, now empowered by his dead sire's vitae, traveled to New Delhi to establish a new cult, the Cult of the Dead God. He still spends his time inflicting pain on mortals, but now, he also seeks to explore the limits of pleasure and suffering that can be inflicted on the unliving bodies of vampires. Number two, Sanjay Chakrabarti. Sanjay was born, literally, on the street of New Delhi to a family of Dalits in the early 20th century. Resentful early in life of his low status, Sanjay set about improving his station and his finances by mugging tourists and foreigners. During one such attack, he and his gang set upon a well-dressed European. They set about their usual routine, threatening the man with their knives, when the largest of the gang, Ekaja, fell to the ground, screaming as though he had been ripped in half. Then another boy fell and started screaming as well. The rest of the gang ran except for the opportunistic Sanjay, who asked the man to teach him the magic that he had just used against the gang. The Ravnos, Vivek Lalji was a member of the Kshatriya caste of the Indian Ravnos, embraced in the early 19th century to fight against the creatures the Ravnos called the Ashura Tazaya. Among themselves, they are known as the Kwaijin. Vivek spent 15 years instructing Sanjay in how to behave and present himself as a Kshatriyas before giving him the embrace. Though he had a place among the Ravnos and all of the fine things that he had desired in life, he was now dead and all of the mortal pleasures he craved in life had been washed away by the thirst for blood. But he still craved what he could no longer enjoy, and that craving eventually turned into monstrosity. Sanjay, through bribes and threats, brought his mortal gang into his fold, 
with Ekaja as his ghoul. Ekaja's job was to procure women for Sanjay, then degrade and humiliate them for Sanjay's entertainment before he drained them of their blood and discarded them. Vivek tried to counsel his errant progeny, but Sanjay would not heed his sire in this. When the Ashura Taziah launched the Great Leap Outward, beginning with the invasion of California and the destruction of the Anarch Free States, Vivek took Sanjay with him to Los Angeles to hunt down the Kwai Jin and to curb the excesses of his progeny by keeping him close at hand. As they settled in and began their investigation into Kwai Jin activity, Zapathashura arose and the Week of Nightmares began. Vivek managed to fight off the frenzy by channeling his beast into an unlucky ghoul close by. But Sanjay simply gave in to the frenzy and attacked his sire while he was distracted. Sanjay diablerized Vivek and experienced a pleasure like he had never known before, and one he would soon become addicted to. After the destruction of the Ravnos Antediluvian, Sanjay did not return to India. Los Angeles was the perfect city for him to indulge his sadistic hedonism in. He regrets killing his sire, but the pleasure of diablerie was so great that he will inevitably seek out other victims. Now divorced from his ruined clan, Sanjay has muscled his way into drug dealing and prostitution in the City of Angels, using a few mortal gangs as his pawns. The instability caused by the Kwaijin invasion of Los Angeles is the only reason that the stronger players in the Jihad haven't crushed this upstart beneath their heel, and he has been wise enough to stay off of the Camarilla and Sabat's respective radars. Number 1. Ankla Hotep Second edition vampire was delightfully and gloriously insane, and I present you now with just a sample of that insanity. Ankla Hotep, Ravnos Methuselah, and the False Cain, as presented in Berlin by Night. Ankla Hotep was embraced by the fourth generation Ravnos, Sminkara, in 1727 BC. Sometime in the 11th century BC, Anklahotep seduced and robbed an Egyptian princess of the 21st dynasty named Nefertiti, not to be confused with the Nefertiti of the 14th century BC, the royal wife of Pharaoh Akhenaten. This Nefertiti would later be embraced by the antediluvian, Set. Anklahotep's unlife is a mystery until the 20th century, when he boarded a vessel in America bound for Britain, christened the RMS Lusitania in 1915. And when the Lusitania went down off of the coast of Ireland, Ankla Hotep went down with it. Someone fished Ankla out of the water, and by the 1930s, he was in the hands of the Germans, specifically the Nazis' Operation Werewolf, dedicated to dissecting, cataloging, and potentially weaponizing the powers of the supernatural for the benefits of the Third Reich. They had no idea of the prize that had fallen into their hands, though a Ravnos Methuselah with significant reality warping powers. But two vampires did know, the Ventru, Peter Kleist, and the Setite, Nefertiti, the very same Nefertiti who had been used and cast aside by Ankla Hotep millennia before. Did anyone order the Ice Cold Play to Revenge? Anybody. Ice Cold Revenge, right here. Anyway, Kleist and Nefertiti had plans for Ankla Hotep. Nefertiti enlisted a Bane mummy and Setite loyalist named Satet Ta, the Darkener of the Earth, who crafted a powerful amulet for Ankla Hotep, enhancing his already formidable disciplines and physical capabilities beyond the limits of his blood, and placed Ankla Hotep under the delusion that he was actually Cain, the father of all vampires. While Ankla Hotep slumbered, Kleist subjected him to a blood bond, placing him under Peter Kleist's control. In 1993, Nefertiti and Kleist loosed their false cane on the divided vampires of Berlin, who commanded them to abandon the Camarilla and Sabat and to follow him or else they would die. Ankla Hotep, armed with Satet Ta's amulet, had the power to silence most doubters as to his authenticity. Yet internally, he struggled mightily against the blood bond Kleist had forced on him, as well as the false memories given to him by the amulet. The feuding courts of Prince Gustav Bredenstein of East Berlin and Prince Wilhelm Waldberg of West Berlin, along with the Tremier Justicar Karl Schreck, united against the false cane. Though it was a Ravnos named Natalia, Ankla Hotep's longtime lover, who broke Ankla Hotep free of his blood bond and convinced him to give up the amulet to Schreck. 
Hotep's fate in the aftermath of the conflict is uncertain, though the Ravnos who entered Berlin shortly before the conflict departed soon after, as the charlatans are often known to do. That concludes the top 10 vampires of Clan Ravnos. I think these guys had a lot more potentials, both as player characters and antagonists, than was utilized, especially if they had been developed more as an anti quasian and anti-Ashira clan, which would have given them an excuse to start popping up in California and the Middle East in mass. Oh well. The next video in the series will be the followers of Set, the Setites. Until next time.